Yes, Lord, I pray that uh, today's message will enter our hearts, help us have full concentration during the preach, and I pray, O oh God, that you remove any form of resistance from our mind so that uh, your word will enter directly from our mind down to our heart, Hallelujah. because you are the reader of the hearts. In the name of Jesus, I'm reading from Romans 10, verses 1 to 13. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know righteousness of God, sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. It's a joy, a privilege, and an honor to be able to join here together with this church family, with this body, to worship our Lord, our Savior, to honor him and exalt him. I think, I think we all realize that the journey of our lives has ups and downs and all sorts of turns. Things you expect to happen never happen. Things you don't accept to happen actually happen. And things you expected to happen in a particular way, in a certain way, turn out to be totally different than you've expected. Then, adding to this, each one of us has his or her unique personality. And we approach life differently than each other. The way I approach life is different than the way you approach life. But no matter what your personality is, no matter the ups and downs and the turns that this journey brings along with it, no matter where you come from, we all need the same exact thing. Or better, we all need the same except, except person, Jesus. 
And we all need the exact same person. We all need Jesus because we all have the same exact problem, sin. Now, before going into today's text, I want to ask a question. The question is, is righteousness a reward or a gift? And to make things simple, we're going to see the difference between a reward and a gift. A reward is giving something to someone in recognition of their services or their efforts or achievements. While a gift is giving something to someone willingly and freely. No strings attached. Now, here in Romans 10, Paul sets forth two ways of righteousness. In Romans 10, verse 5, Paul says, talks about the righteousness that is by the law. And then in verse 6, he talks about the righteousness that is by faith. So we have two ways of righteousness, the righteousness that is by the law and the righteousness that is by faith. Now, the Jews pursued the first way, seeing it, seeing righteousness as a reward for human achievement. But God, but God makes the second way available as a gift to all. Jews, Gentiles, black, white, poor, rich, young and old, all. And he makes it available through faith in his son, Jesus. Christ's redemptive work at Calvary makes this possible. Now, regarding the righteousness that is based on the law, Paul quotes Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, where it says, You should therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Here we see that all those who keep the law will have life. But we also know, we also heard and read what Paul says in Romans. And Paul says that no one can keep the law. Everyone violates the law of God. To show contrast between the righteousness based on faith and the righteousness that comes from the law, in Romans 10, then in Romans 10, verses 6, 7, and 8, Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 to 14. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read the scripture, but I'm going to give you a summary of what it says. Here it says that there is no need to travel to heaven to bring Christ to earth. God already sent him into the world. Nor should anyone think they must bring Christ up from the realm of the dead. God has raised Christ from the dead. What does this mean? It means that God doesn't require any superhuman works or any superhuman efforts. What God requires is faith in the gospel. Faith in his son Jesus. Faithfulness and obedience towards him. And I really like what, what the preacher, what the theologian, call him whatever, Jonathan Edwards said. He said, I'm going to quote, Our task, in other words, is not to be responsible for salvation, but to be respondable to it. So we are to respond God's salvation. And how are we going to respond to his salvation? By being faithful, obedient, serve him, serve the church, worship him, pray, all the things that we need to do to grow in our faith. So it is important that we make this clear. God is responsible for our salvation. And God, since God saved us, then works will follow. Good works will follow. Now, the Jews were trying to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of God. The problem for the Jewish people is very much the same problem we have nowadays. What is this problem? 
The problem that our culture has is the same problem the Jews had. It is our self-salvation plan. We want to save ourselves. A plan where I don't get saved by what God does for me, but I get saved by the things that I do. How I make atonement for my own mistakes. Now, I remember the first time I was present at a Teen Challenge conference. And I remember all the leaders from different countries. They all had the same thought, the same idea, the same end goal. And their idea was that each and every student in the program would live a sober life, find a good job, get married, and have kids. And I remember I, when I was hearing these words, I was scratching my head. And even till uh, nowadays, whenever, whenever I'm uh, present at one of these conferences, these words sadden me. And why am, why am I saying these things? These things, actually, they're, they're all good things. It's good to live a sober life. It's good to find a wife, have kids. It's good. But we can live a sober life. We can have a good job, we can own a business, we get married, we have kids, but still going to hell. So what's the end goal? What, are, which, what should be our focus? Our focus should be Jesus, his grace, his salvation. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the proverb that goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we have to ask ourselves, are we trying to live a life better than we used to, hoping it will make us right with God, or are we receiving the free gift of salvation that comes from Jesus? Remember the rich young ruler. Let's turn, let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. Mark 10, 17 to 22. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and ma mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. This man was confident in his own status and riches. He thought he was good enough to inherit eternal life. And even if he did obey all these commands that Jesus mentioned, he was still missing something. And Jesus catches him on the first command. Jesus seeing that this man worship the idols of wealth and social status, tells him to sell his goods and then follow him. Disheartened by the saying, what did this man do? He went away sorrowful. So, brothers and sisters, let us never be found professing Christ while remaining idolaters. I'm going to repeat that. Let us never be found professing Christ while remaining idolaters. What shall we do then? Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 are a very important and critical portion of Scripture. Paul says, he mentions two things. He mentions, um, he says, you will be saved if you do these two things. One, 
if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, it is not enough to simply acknowledge that Jesus is God, that he is Lord of the universe. The demons acknowledge that. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 19, we read, You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder, they tremble. Now, the demon, the demon's theology is impeccable, and their Christology is perfect. They know God's, they know Jesus' deity, they know his nature, their Christology is perfect. They know God is sovereign, but it doesn't mean that they are saved. So what does it mean to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? It means to confess with your mouth, each and every one of us. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. Confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. A deep personal conviction that Jesus is my master. That Jesus bought me with his precious blood. That I no longer have any rights over myself because I belong to him. Thank you, Jesus. We must have that deep personal conviction. I'm not my own, but I belong to Jesus. This is not my body. This is the body of the Holy Spirit. This is his temple, and I should honor it. In Luke 9, 23, we read, If anyone would come after me, this is Jesus speaking, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, and follow me. The gospel is not about self-fulfillment. It's about self-denial. It's not about making Jesus part of your life so he makes you a better person or to give you everything you ask him. It's not like, hey, Jesus, you, now you're part of my life. Uh, make me rich. Make me successful. Restore my relationships. No, it's not about that. It's about coming before Jesus. Beating on my chest and tell him, God, in your grace, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. And I need you to save me and change me. That's the gospel. Jesus, you are my master. I want to die for self and to submit to your will and your plans. That's the gospel. The second thing to do, Paul says, is to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, the statement encompasses more than just the resurrection. We have to believe in the deity of Christ. We have to believe in the, in the sovereignty of Christ, the lordship of Christ, and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Believing in our hearts, the facts, the truths, the promises of the gospel. So what must we do to be saved? Being a good person, be doing good works. Yes, these are good things. But I must confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. He's Lord over my life. And surrender each and every area of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And believing in his finished work on the cross. Believing in his resurrection, knowing that he's coming back for his church. I have to close, but before closing, I want to, I want to say something else. Give an example, maybe. Maybe it might sound a stupid example, but it really hurts me, it really saddens me, it burdens me. When I hear people, or even Christians, they say that they read scripture, and then they say, ah, I feel 
the scripture in my heart means this thing. First of all, this is God's word. And let's find out what God's want to say and not what I feel, the emotions I get when reading God's word. So let me give you an example. Imagine we're driving, I don't know, on the coast road or at Talbarani, and you have a sign, a speed sign. And the speed limit is 80 kilometers per hour. And I'm driving and I'm going at 100 kilometers per hour. Okay, the officer stops me and he tells me that you were speeding. I tell him, yes, sir, yes, I know that the sign says 80 kilometers per hour. And I know that I was going 100 kilometers per hour. But you know what? That 100 kilometers per hour in my heart is an 80 kilometers per hour. Does that make sense? It doesn't. Or else, the officer stops me. I tell him, yes, I know the sign says 80. But let me tell you something. That sign doesn't apply for nowadays because as soon as I step on the gas, my car reaches 100 kilometers per hour. So that's not too, that's, that's outdated. Now, as I told you, it might be a stupid example, but it's, it's true, it makes sense. And it's the same thing with the Bible. God is the same. He doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and evermore. His word doesn't change. Everything shall pass, but the word of God remains the same and remains forever. My thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, they change more than I blink my eyes. But God stays the same. So let's cling to the cross. Let's cling to our Lord's grace, his mercy. Thank him for his salvation, not taking his grace lightly and for granted. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.